Good morning and welcome. Welcome to Nashville and welcome to Distributive Health. I'm Beth Breeden. With, I'm a professor in pharmacy and informatics at Lipscomb University's College of Pharmacy here. Um, a native Nashvillian, so the accent is authentic. Um, but glad to have you all here and glad to welcome this dream, dream panel. Um, the Synaptic Health Alliance. How many of you are familiar with that alliance? Oh, great. So you are in for a super treat as well, too, because we're going to talk a little bit about the elements of that alliance. We're going to talk about um, how it came to be, what's involved with it currently. And even more excitingly, we're going to talk about the technology that's been utilized. And then we're also going to, uh, to dive into uh, a bit of the results. So you're hearing these here, fresh out of the oven, brand new results. <laughs> Um, so excited to welcome our distinguished panel, the Dream Team, as I call them. So I'll let them introduce themselves, and we'll start with Mike from... Uh, Hi, I'm Mike Jacobs. I'm a senior distinguished engineer with Optum, which is part of the United Health Group, and my job is to spearhead all of our assessments, guidance, and implementation of blockchain-based projects. I'm David Murtaugh with a, a company called Multiplan, which a lot of you might not have heard of if we weren't part of this alliance. That's probably intentional. We don't market to consumers. Uh, we work with health plans and we do cost containment for, uh, for out-of-network claims primarily. And one of our biggest products is our, our PPO network. We have a network of about a million providers, and that's my responsibility, is managing all, all the provider data from the second they join our network, credentialing them through the, the challenge that we're here to talk about today, which is maintaining an accurate directory. So uh, this, is, this is right in our wheelhouse to be involved in. Hello, my name is Kyle Culver. I'm a lead enterprise architect with Humana and currently leading Humana's blockchain efforts. Awesome, welcome. I told you it was a dream panel and it certainly is. Let's talk just a quick moment about um, just a quick introduction to, uh, to the Alliance and, and what we're seeing there. So basically, um, maintaining all this provi provider data is a huge pain point for provider, I mean for payers. Um, and we've seen anywhere from uh, estimates of $2.1 billion a year to maintain all this. Huge regulatory aspects in the space as well too, where providers are um, uh, having to keep that information up to date and the payers as well too. Um, so we have a huge pain, po pain point in this, and so it's an elegant solution to look at the potential of blockchain um, in this. The Alliance has five members um, and one solution that they're looking for. So it was Humana, it was Optum, um, it was United Healthcare, Quest was involved as well too, um, and Multiplan. So we're going to talk a little bit, and we're going to start with Mike um, and, and talk about um, this alliance and how it developed. I mean, clearly, um, we've got some uh, folks here that are, that are competitors, but they're all working together to solve one thing in healthcare. So, Mike, let's talk about how that alliance started. Sure. So, uh, Optus been working on uh, experimenting and implementing blockchain for about two and a half years, and um, about a year ago, we were we were running ideation contests uh, to figure out what kind of use cases would make sense to use the technology. And what we found that we learned a lot about uh, what, what it's uh, not good for, but also what it's good for. Sure. And um, the provider data management uh, came to the top of the, top of the list. And um, through conferences like this, in fact, um, our initial um, uh, foray into forming the alliance was between Kyle and myself at lunch at Distributed Health last year. Very nice. And uh, we had heard uh, whispers around uh, Humana doing something very similar with provider data management. And, we've, and one of the things that we learned about the technology is that um, it's, it's most suitable when you have multiple organizations involved that want to um, exchange or share information, audit that information, and even automate processes that cross enterprise boundaries. And so it was a new set of problems that we were um, trying to think about and it, somewhat of a natural outcome of that is the need to have partners and create an alliance. And so over lunch, we um, gin very gingerly described what we were both working on, having no NDA yet. <laughs> and then um, by, by December, so that was in September, by December, we had a signed agreement with all five companies, nice. all driven through uh, networking. And then uh, January of this year was our first face-to-face -face planning meeting. And April was our press release announcing 
uh, the alliance without a name. And so the name is Synaptic Health Alliance is something that we worked on this summer. And we've just launched our website, synaptichealthalliance.com. Fantastic. So that's where we are today. That is fantastic. It just goes to show you that the hallway conversations at these conferences are truly beneficial and the, and the benefits that you see from that. Right. I also want to um, share uh, the, so the name and the branding of the Synaptic Health Inform, uh, Alliance. So you have, for instance, the Synapse, and so clearly there's a nod there. But also, I don't want you to miss the nod to blockchain as well, too. SHA, Synaptic Health Alliance. So uh, referring to uh, the algorithms and the hashing algorithms. So, secure, um, the secure health, um, hashing algorithm. Right? Exactly. Right. So very excited to, uh, to point that out to you had you not seen that. Engineers had a little <laughs> brand influence there. Yeah. A little wink and a nod. I <laughs> right. think that always works out nicely. It yeah. works out well. So David, let's talk a bit about the problems that we were seeing. I mean, those pain points are there. Clearly, with Multiplan, y'all have seen that and experienced that on a daily basis. So let's flesh that out a bit for the audience. Yeah, and I, I think um, Senator Frist at the beginning said a couple of things that set really good context for a lot of problems in the industry, and this one in particular. Uh, the first one is a siloed approach, and the second one is uh, government getting involved with the best intentions of helping create better access and availability for our patients. And what we've seen probably in the last five or 10 years, it started with CMS uh, looking at the directories for their Medicare Advantage plans and saying, we think there's a standard that should be upheld. But beyond that, it's, it's pretty much delegated to states. So I, I sit on a regulatory committee within our company and we meet monthly and almost every month another state has either come out with something new or amended, refined their directory uh, regulation. And they basically agree on two things. They agree there's a set of core data elements, and they agree that so, there's some audit inspection standard, but every detail beyond that varies. Some states have four data elements they care about. Some states, California, probably the, the biggest offender, has uh, a list of 20 plus. And some states say you should audit on a regular basis. Other states say exactly how frequently, how to reach out, and they, they have uh, imposed even potential repercussions that we, as health plans, can put back to the provider, which I think there's a lot of hesitancy to do, uh, withhold claim payment, for example, because those that are actually sending in claims and you have a good working relationship with are not the ones that you're struggling to keep up in your directory. But the siloed approach is the other challenge, where we're all doing the same exact thing. It's funny, as we got together with this group, I had never had as much uh, direct interaction with, with my peers at these other companies. So to talk to the people who manage provider data management at United and at Humana, and uh, in one of our face-to-face our -face meetings, we put up and said, just for context for everybody, here's what we do to maintain our, our directory accuracy. And the, the guys from the other company said, yeah, we have the same PowerPoint. You know, we deliver it to anybody who asks us as well. So we're all doing these redundant faxes, phones, uh, we're creating portals for them to log into, and Beth referenced $2.1 billion a year we're spending as an industry to do that. Look at from the provider's perspective as well, I think it's about 19 or 20 network relationships that a provider has, so it's not that we're operating in silos and it's just inefficient for, for the health plans. It's for uh, any provider, they're getting 20 phone calls every single quarter. We all have different contacts, right? Some, some of us might like to go to the credentialing coordinator. Someone else has like a, a front desk administrative person that they go to, sure. and we all get a little bit different information as well. So it's, it's a challenge mm -hmm. that, as, as it's not something that manpower can solve, right? We've, we've kind of doubled the amount of people making calls. We've worked with other vendors that provide data, and it, you don't see the accuracy rates really tick up in a meaningful way from any of those investments. And even with all that effort and all those pain points that we're seeing, what is our result? I mean, are we seeing suboptimal results? Are we seeing credential, credentialing in this provider information that is succinct, that is clean uh, and available? We, we do our own internal audits, and we find that our director is very clean when we audit it ourselves. But uh, the most probably objective measure of that has been CMS auditing uh, Medicare Advantage directories, and they find about 48% have some level of inaccuracy with 48% of entries in a directory. And I, I can almost rationalize that to a certain extent because there's a lot of data elements in a directory. Sure. Office hours change, wait times change, the, whether they're accepting new patients can change pretty quickly. Um, but a third of those inaccuracies are just providers not at that address. So that's just, 
if you show up there looking for a doctor, they're not going to physically be there. And that's the one, to me, I, it's hard to rationalize and you kind of say, look, as an industry, we need to be a little bit better than that. We publish these things all online. Mm -hmm. I make an update in my database today. It's out there within a couple hours at the most for somebody to see. So there's really not an excuse for your, your data becoming that old and that stale. And it's, it's really, from a health plan's perspective, one of our uh, key kind of rubber hits the road interactions with a, with a patient. So we've got a, a terrible problem that we're, we're trying to solve. So uh, looking for a solution, that white horse to ride in, uh, is it blockchain riding the white horse to solve this solution? So, um, so Kyle, talk to us a little bit about the Alliance, about how it was formed, how the project and the pilot were initiated. Sure. So, you know, we all kind of came together, as Mike was talking about, in January, and we all had different points of view. Um, so Optima had done a lot of work um, around what their point of view was and some build in that space, and then Humana had as well. And so a lot of those were, were kind of coming together and saying, hey, what do we want to test? What's the scope of this? You know, now with five companies looking together, scope becomes very, very important on what we're trying to learn from this. Um, and also trying to give credibility to the problem. There's a reason that this problem hasn't been solved and it's not because it's easy, right? And there's a lot of vendors in this space, there's a lot of data being shared. And so um, us throwing all this data on a blockchain isn't gonna magically solve this, this problem. And so trying to structure ourselves to where we have people that were, they were focused on the technology, um, looking technically, you know, what's, what's it gonna take for us to work together. Also looking at the, the business value assessment. And if we put this data together, where can we extract value um, and, and then also um, from an execution perspective. So within the pilot time frame, these are the things that we're looking to test um, and how are we tracking with those? Do we need other data elements? Um, and kind of scoping that to where it's manageable and, and to where we think that that could be successful. And then the other aspect um, is the governance aspect and looking at like, how are we all gonna work together? Um, so we had those work streams, they're kind of driving that together. And then we had day-to-day -day leads as well for each organization that were kind of that point of, of contact for the Alliance to, to go and uh, either talk to legal teams or communications or all the different people that we need to work with in these large organizations um, to make this work. Um, and then also uh, an executive team from you know, one member um, from each company you know, that were weighing in and ho helping us steer this forward. So that's kind of how we organized. And, and then from a pilot perspective, you know, looking at a, a narrow region um, and saying, let's do it within this geographical area, right? Let's see if we can be successful um, within this area and then painting that picture. And tomorrow there's a, you know, a presentation from Jason. And they'll, they'll get more into those pilot results and, and have visuals around those. But trying to look at this area and see how we can collaborate together um, to share that cost as well as to understand is there value when we overlap the data that we wouldn't be able to uh, see within our own internal database. Very nice, very nice. Great efforts there um, thus far uh, in the collaborative and in the alliance. So Mike, many companies are taking a wait and see approach to blockchain. Clearly, uh, there's a significant amount of hype. Is this going to solve all the problems? No, it's not. But let's look at opportunities that it will solve. And this sounds like um, uh, a, a, a problem that's looking for a great solution. So what recommendations would you have for those companies that are sort of saying, let's just tap the brakes, stay back and see how these types of alliances are working? Sure, so um, depending upon what survey you look at, there's between 40 and 70% hesitancy in the industry in general around the adoption of the technology. And so I, I see this more as an early adopter phase right now that uh, you need to have uh, a culture of innovation and risk taking and fast learning as opposed to fast failing, failing fast, and um, begin to experiment. So if you feel as though you're, you are one of those leading adopters, um, have, let, let somebody experiment. The engineers will probably go crazy first, <laughs> um, but the, uh, you want to be sure that it doesn't turn into a science project in the engineering organization. Mm -hmm. you want to, you want to be sure that you steer your ship toward a use case focused approach sure. and um, theorize on the business value that a a, uh, the use of that technology could apply to a business problem. And it could be a business problem that, um, or a solution to a broader problem that doesn't even replace anything. It's really a supplemental. So we've talked about there's Greenfield. Greenfield's kind of hard to find right now, mm -hmm. but supplemental is uh, helping along an existing process is I think the best opportunity. And the provider data management is a, is a, a logical choice for us, largely because there's uh, very little in the way of regulatory risk. 
we try to uh, lower our barrier of entry from uh, collaborating. So bringing together um, competitors together and trying to reduce the, um, or, or increase the, the level of trust through cooperation. That's the business people and the technology aspects all have to come together to get started. Sure, and it has to be a full approach as well, too, uh, yeah. from that perspective. So I'd like to ask all of you to comment on this as well, too. So uh, how do you think the Alliance has solved some of these problems as far as you all come in together? Maybe strength in numbers, you feel a little more comfortable working with these other organizations as opposed to, to uh, spearheading this on your own. So let's um, have feedback from all three of you on how you feel like the Alliance has overcome that. I mean, I, th I think there's, uh, in my mind, I, I picture, I can put myself in the settings, of, like key, key moments where that philosophy that we went in in January, the first time we met, we said, we're gonna trust each other, we're gonna be transparent, we're gonna manage by consensus. It's not always possible with five completely different organizations mm -hmm. to have 100% consensus, but there are things that you have to kind of uh, honor and, and draw a line on, and we've, we've discussed it brand, and mm -hmm. we're putting something out there publicly with our brands, and financial, right? We're not going to commit to investments on behalf of another organization. And I think honoring those things, and there, there's been times where we all went in with the best of intentions, but where there's, you know, some reasonable and healthy disagreement, and people were willing to s stand okay. up and say, this is why I feel this way. Sure. In a very transparent uh, and, and measured conversation, and, and everybody understood, and we said, okay, thank you for speaking up, first of all, this isn't gonna work if we don't, and now let's, let's find a solution. And I think having a, a few of those events that we kind of work together as a team has made us uh, significantly stronger. And I know from, from Multiplan's perspective, we're just nervous about, uh, you know, United and Humana are big clients of ours. Sure. Quest is a huge partner and as part of our network, and part of our, our value proposition is, is data quality, as is any health plan, right? So to to uh, lift the veil on our data and say, here's where ours is junk, <laughs> let's compare it to, <laughs> to yours and yep. see, it, see if we can help each other out, was a, a big step in conversations we had internally with our, our executives and our account management teams and saying, you know, th these clients are going to have access to more data than, than you're usually giving them. Is that something we're okay with? And, and everybody came around that and said, yeah, we need to solve this problem it's together. Not, yeah, it's not competitive data, so. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. I'm just impressed that you could coordinate schedules around all those companies, so that's pretty <laughs> impressive in and of itself. If you can solve that, I think the blockchain piece will fall into place rather nicely. Right. Well, right. Tell us oh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Kyle. Um, and also, and I think David's touching on some of this, but the, the cultural aspects, you know, and we're, we're here for the same reason, right? In, in the sense that we see this as a problem, this is an industry problem, we're looking to have a collaborative solution, not a competitive product in this space. And so with that intent, when people are voicing their concerns or things, we're, we're all trying to get after the same thing. And so I think uh, terminology becomes a big thing, trying to understand, you know, the, the positive intent that someone has and where they're coming from. And I think together, you know, uh, and David was talking about this as well, like learning from your peers um, is a unique opportunity in this space, not just for provider data, but also blockchain. We're talking about security and some of those things. And so we're connecting these different groups across the organization to talk about the best way in which to do some of these things. And so there's a lot of value with that. Um, and, and then there's different um, value propositions for each company, right? And so Quest Diagnostics, the value that it's going to create, create or um, receive out of this um, alliance is different than a payer would. And so trying to understand and, and grow from that and understand these different perspectives, I think has been really um, valuable to all the organizations participating. Yeah, the last point I'd like sure. to make is that um, going into January, we had some principles that we um, discussed around how we wanted to work together. And um, in terms of lowering the bound uh, barrier of entry um, to get cooperation among competitors, we elected to um, solve a problem for the good of the system, not for the good of our revenue streams. And that exactly. we agreed that a utility would benefit all, sort of the tide rise, uh, sure. rises all boats. Um, and that we would, we would clearly distinguish between the alliance utility that we are using to blockchain technology to, to share that information and any competitive kind of com commercial offerings that we might happen to build on top of that. And so even at architectural uh, discussions or use case discussions, um, we're talking about that boundary all the time. Very nice, very nice, great point, great point. 
Well, let's talk about that technology. I think that's probably something everyone in the room is anxious to find out. Um, what was your technology. Exactly. <laughs> Which one did you use? Yep. Why was that used? Any sure. lessons learned thus far from that? Let's, I mean, we'll have all of you offer feedback on that if you'd like. Yeah, so uh, multiple um, members have been pursuing various technology experiments um, over the last couple of years. Uh, for, so I'll speak for what Optum's experience was. Um, the, um, so we started with sort of a paper exercise. We looked at the inventory of all the different choices that we had. And this was two years ago. I inventoried 30-something um, different choices. I thought, well, how the heck am I going to choose among the 30 choices? And so um, set up a series of, and so with, we have a, I use more of a commercial um, perspective that eventually I want to create a commercial product against it. Um, I also have an enterprise perspective where I also need to be able to support um, tens of thousands of developers um, potentially using the technology. And so I need a repeatable, supportable platform. And so I, I established a scoring mechanism and scored it against the 34. And what came to the top at the time was uh, um, Hyperledger Fabric. Nice. And we used Hyperledger Fabric for about nine months, learned quite a bit from it, found a few things that uh, weren't going to be conducive to scaling to the size that we'd like to see. And so we then said again, uh, the technology um, suppliers are leapfrogging one another. And so this isn't necessarily a final answer. But the, uh, we did another assessment and found that uh, J.P. Morgan's Quorum met a lot of those requirements around being open source, enterprise supported, and also um, with an eye toward future use cases for our uh, alliance as well as for our enterprise, the ability to have private transactions. Okay. And so uh, that's where we're sitting today. It's like I said, it's not our, necessarily our final answer, but. Uh, this is what we're using in our technology value assessment. Really great approach there. Yeah. Sure, and, and so I think, you know, the perspective I took before we started the Alliance um, and then even into the Alliance is looking at it as, you know, comparable to, you know, some of the other database selections you may have to make, right? I mean, uh, there's relational databases, you know, you can have SQL Server, you can have Oracle, they have their advantages, but they should be able to get you over the line, right? You should be able to do this on that. And so is that really where we want to spend our time is evaluating 30 and building 30, you know? And so I think that the big thing was trying to figure out, hey, we believe that this will get us to the place that we need to go. Um, we can learn in parallel um, about the differences between them, but not trying to get too hung up or, or spend a lot of time there because, and, and these guys will speak to this as well, you know, the majority of our conversations are not about the technology, mm -hmm. right? It's about how to make this work from a governance perspective, from a business model perspective, how to extract value out, out of the data that we're sharing. So there's so many conversations that need to have um, and that provide value to this group as opposed to digging into uh, the stuff as an engineer that I would really love to dig into, uh, potentially aren't the most valuable to this group. Very nice, great. So we've got a good idea about the approach, about what they looked at, um, where they are currently. So let's talk about some of those results. What are some early results that you're seeing? Those pearls, the wish we knew then, what we know now. We did not find a silver bullet to, to identify exactly where a doctor is practicing today. But um, not, yet, anyway. not yet. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> but one of the things we've talked about, there's, there's uh, five of us, and, and Mike tar talked uh, earlier about you know, for any of these problems, the need to, um, to have partners. And even with, with the number of people and organizations engaged today, Kyle said it very well recently, you know, we're trying to uh, crowdsource information without a big enough crowd sometimes. So there's still a level of um, verification that we have to do based on what we're, we're learning from sharing each other's data. But we are finding um, there's, there's definitely multiple paths to getting direct business value and starting to see a return on this investment uh, as we go into the next year. One of which is just, um, when, we, when we embarked on this, and Kyle talked about it a little bit, we picked a target geographic area, and we did our overlap analysis, and we picked an area that had the m most overlap among members. And then the, the operations team started to hypothesize, like, what would we look for in the data? What exactly do we want to get from each other? So we want to see not just what, where you believe they're practicing, but also show me everything you've turned off for that doctor in the last year. And so w what hypotheses do we start to form? We say, well, if there's a disagreement on whether they're active at a certain location, that seems like something to dig into. Or if 
we all ha have relationships with this doctor, but I'm the only one that has an address for them. That's kind of a red flag, right? Why am I the only one that thinks they're, they're practicing at this place? So we started to test those hypotheses independently. And we came back around as a group and are comparing those notes. The exact numbers differ, but we're all seeing it's, it's more efficient than working in our own siloed vacuum. Right? So for our example, we do a lot of phone calls to providers, as do all health plans. And we, we aren't always looking for doing those strictly just to find the bad data. We're just calling to verify. We'll take any small updates. But it is our highest priority always is to take a bad address out, that 33% I mentioned earlier where they're just not working there. Always our highest priority to find those. That's what we want to do uh, as quickly as possible to make it as smooth of a uh, member or patient experience as we can. And the rate at which we find bad data doing just our own outreach versus uh, what we were able to do with uh, what we've called like hot leads or the opportunities provided by the, the other alliance members makes us five to seven times more efficient depending on exactly how we carve up the data. So we will, we will clean up our directory much more quickly than we would have just going out there and canvassing our million providers on our own by taking these, these cues from others. And then, um, do you want to talk a little bit about the other, uh, the other efficiencies that we're doing with the uh, sharing of the overhead? Well, just looking at it from a, like there's data that we all have, right? Our current perspective on all these records, right? And, and so going through that, we can see some insights of where people agree and don't agree, um, or where we all agree, or, or different date and timing things around that. But then there's also uh, the process perspective and looking at how we share costs. So if, we, if I make a phone call right now, and I found out that Dr. Smith is no, no longer on Market Street, how do I give that data efficiently to everyone who cares if Dr. Smith's on Market Street or not? Which is different in, in how that works than saying, hey, here's all my data, and then trying to, to pull valuable pieces out of it. And so that goes more to this cost sharing model and understanding kind of the process in which that works. And looking at that very much from a um, invalidation um, as an event that we're trying to share as well as validation and trying to scope it to that. Did we learn and confirm that this person's there or do we confirm that they're not? Now a lot of our calls don't generate that, that Boolean, you know, yes or no, right? There's context that comes from that. And so just trying to understand how we share that more effectively um, is, is very different than, I guess, doing all that analysis. So I'd say that um, if you go to our website, um, there'll be a white paper. The white paper will talk about the business problem and the technology choice, but not detailed results yet. We do have every intention to publish more details in 2019. Um, and so we're still spending, our, spending time getting to the details. It's, it's interesting. We, we all went out there and we had these initial hypotheses about what we'd look for in the data. And we all went out and, and made our phone calls, did our verifications based on what we thought we were seeing from each other's data. And then I think as, as we've uh, kind of shared this within our organizations and gotten other people from our operational teams to look at it, they're saying, like, hey, did you, did you look at it from this angle? You know, Quest has a really unique perspective. They just picked up a sample in the last 90 days. Maybe we should use that a few different ways than the health plan data. And so even, we, we had an initial set of hypotheses and then we went back and compared notes, and uh, just last week we, um, we got a more formal presentation from the operations folks at United about what they were learning, and I said, hey, can you send me that? I have now some new ways I need to look at our data. So it's this constant, constant learning, learning process, right. absolutely. Right. We're, we're, we're still notes. kind of at the early stages, but we are identifying, to Kyle's point, very specific use cases where we feel like 2019 will we'll pivot from a, a pure learning and experimentation into starting to extract some business value from this right. collaboration. Move to production. So we certainly think we'll get to the golden record uh, soon, we hope, and then uh, the collaboration and the alliance has done significant work already. We want to applaud your efforts, applaud what you're doing. Um, I think the collaborative approach is always great. I think it's exponential. We can learn more from each other um, and the, the value that uh, you'll use for this, um, for these pain points that we're having as well as for uh, future use cases as well too, um, is significant around the permission to blockchains and around the elements that we're seeing there. And so, um, so as I knew this uh, panel would uh, go by very quickly, but we hope you've gotten some great information. We don't have a question and answer session, but all the attendees are here, so please feel free to, to reach out and to uh, contact us for more information on this. But I want to give a, a significant round of applause, applause for my dream panel. Y'all were fantastic. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you.
you all have a great lunch session, and we'll see you back here uh, at that time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.